Welcome back. Thank you for clicking on today's video. Today we're going to be talking about the sampling distribution of a statistic. So let's start with the basics. You're going to see me creating a population. All right, get her done. All right, so this is our population. It's a population of little people, all different colors. Now, when you perform a statistical inference, your goal is to take from a population a sample. So some sample through some sampling method. So this is the entire group. This is the entire or the all or the whole group. And that's why we refer to this as a population. And then remember that a sample is going to be some subset of that. So let's say I do some sampling method. So some sampling method to pull from the population into a sample. So I have maybe this group that I selected and this is my sample. Now, when you have values that are referring to the population, remember that those are called parameters. So I could maybe have the average height of this group of my population, or maybe I could have the proportion of uh, people with you know, brown eyes. So these two values are called a parameter and they would be used to describe this population. So these numbers are describing that population. Now, if I were to find the average height for this group, or I was to find the average, or excuse me, the proportion of people with brown eyes, I would have X bar for average height and P hat. Now these are statistics because they are referring to the sample. With me so far? So we got a population. I did some sampling method to get a sample. The values referring to the population are called parameters. And right now we're dealing with mu, average height for the population, and p, proportion of people with blue eyes. The sample then is going to have x bar, x bar, the average height for the group, or it could have the proportion of people with blue eyes. These are called statistics because they're referring to the sample. These are called parameters because they're referring to the population. Now, <clears throat> every time you take a new sample, so let's say this is sample one. Let's say you took another sample and you got sample two. And this time we had this, 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 and maybe this. Now, with this group, they would, because they're a different group, probably have their own X bar and P hat values, right? They'd have a different average height and a different proportion of people with uh, brown eyes. Let's say we did it again. So we took a third sample. And this time we get this, maybe we get this twice, and maybe this. Well, this is a new group, right? Different group, different random sample. They probably have their own X bar and P hat as well. Different. So if we did it again and we took a fourth sample, this time maybe we had this sample. Well, just like before, it's a different random sample, so I would expect a different value of X bar and P hat. Now, they're all coming from this same population, but because the sample is different, because it's a different random sample, I have different values for X bar and I have different values of P hat. These values didn't change, but these are or did change with different samples. Now, let's say hypothetically, you decided to take every single conceivable random sample of, well, here we were doing size four. So you kept doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it until you got every possible combination or you had all possible values of X bar or all possible values of p hat. So moving forward, let's just focus on p hat because the results are the same, but essentially that's the idea. We're getting different values of our statistic for new samples. So if we were to get all possible values of p hat, what kind of group is that? When we said all, I've said repeatedly that all, whole, entire refers to a population. So you'd have a population of values of p hat. That actually is referred to as the sampling distribution of a statistic, which specifically here would be sampling distribution of p hat. Okay. So what happens then is when you take every conceivable random sample, you end up with a population of not people. They're not people anymore because these people have made p hat values. You are going to get a population of p hat values. 
Now, the reason that you have different values is because you took all conceivable random samples and a different random sample would have a different group of people or whatever it was you're studying in it. So we have a population of all conceivable values of p hat, which is what we call a sampling distribution of a statistic. And specifically here, remember, our statistic is p hat. So in this situation, you, to be able to describe that sampling distribution, need to discuss three things. You'll need to figure out the center, the variability, and the shape. Before we move on, this might seem really weird and pointless because why would you want to take all conceivable random samples to find every possible p hat value? Don't you, when you end up doing a statistical inference, just take one sample to estimate the population? Yes. Why are we doing this then? Because we need to understand the characteristics of all of these p hat values so we know how to properly use it to estimate p, which is our long-term goal. A statistical inference takes a sample to make an inference on a population, and it does do it just one time. But to be able to do it effectively and correctly, you need to understand how these p hat values act and how they look in comparison to that parameter you're trying to estimate so you can use them well and do a good job of doing your estimation. So these are the three things that we're going to focus on. I'm going to use an example that's shown in the textbook, which is looking at the proportion of registered voters in the state of Florida that voted as a minor party affiliation. So in the textbook, RP is 0 0.028. This is a parameter because it's from the entire state of Florida. Okay. Now, remember, three things we're interested in. We're interested in where the center is, we're interested in the variability, and we are interested in the shape. So for this particular distribution, we're going to find all of these things. So starting with the center, it appears that the center here, boom, 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 is about, I don't know, this spot. So if you stack those bars, that's what I see. So center about 0 0.03 is what it looks like to me. All right, the variability. So it ranges from 0 to 0 0.1, okay? And then the shape appears to be right skewed. All right, this is when we have samples of size 100. And this is also looking at the sampling distribution of p hat, which means what you're seeing here is actually stacks and stacks of p hat values. So from all of those different random samples, all of these that came up with p hat values, that's what's being graphed here. It's a bunch of p hat values. These are not people, okay? First one, this is what we see. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move up to samples of size 250. Still the sampling distribution of p hat, which means what you're seeing here in the graph is stacks of p hat values. These are not people. This distribution does not refer to people. It refers to values of p hat, okay? Now, remember, we had center, we had variability, and shape. All right. So starting with the center, this one's a little easier to see, appears to be at about 0 0.03. The variability is ranging from 0 to, say, 0 0.07. And the shape appears to be slightly right skewed. It's not as right skewed as the last one, so we'll just say slightly right skewed. Okay, so we see that's from going from 100 as our sample sizes that created that p hat to 250. Next one. So this one jumps up all the way to 500. Okay. So we still are going to be interested in the center. We're going to be interested in the variability and the shape. Center appears to be at 0 0.03. Variability is at maybe, I don't know, that one looks at 0 0.01 to about 0 0.05. And the shape, I don't say the spell shapes. So what are some things we're noticing overall? So overall, what is something that you actually think that you notice about the center? Let's start with that. What have you just noticed about the center? So from 100, we had a center of about 0 0.03. Saw that there. From 250, we had a center of about 0 0.03. And from this sampling distribution, we had a center of about 0 0.03. So what appears to be the case or the trend is that for these sampling distributions, it appears that all of our centers are about 0 0.03, which remember is our parameter value. That's the first fact that we found. So fact number one, the center, I can spell, I promise, the center of the sampling distribution of p hat, I don't know why I'm writing like this, but is p. That's huge, that's huge. If you're using p hat to estimate p, it is a great thing to know that p hat naturally centers itself around p. That's like saying that if we're using that dartboard analogy again, p hat, it's just destined. It's working its hardest to find p. That's a good thing. Next thing, what do we notice? Variability. 
Okay, so this is our p hats that were from the smallest sample size, which is 100. So we have a variability of 0 to 0 0.1. When we move up to a very um, a sample size of 250, it goes from 0 to 0 0.07, so it got smaller. And then when we move up to 500, it goes from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05. So what we notice is that our second fact, we saw it happen, and this is a fact, that the variability of the sampling distribution goes down as the sample size increases. So variability seems to decrease as, remember the sample size is n, as sample size increases. That's huge. That means that the more people you have, you're having less variability, which makes sense. Because if you're trying to uh, talk about the state of Florida, for example, having 100 people versus 500 people, I would expect that this group would be doing a little bit better job because there's more people. So fact number two, more sample size, smaller variability. So the last thing that you maybe noticed is that when you look at these distributions, it begins to look more and more bell-shaped or normally distributed. So that's fact number three. As sample size increases, increases, the shape becomes, becomes, oy babe, roughly normal distributed. Now, the same would be true if we were looking at the sampling distribution for X bar. So the center of the sampling distribution of X bar, you would notice it would be mu. So same thing. All of the X bars center themselves around mu. We would also notice that as you did a sampling distribution for X bar, you'd have the same thing. The variability would decrease as the sample size increased. And you would also notice that the sample size, as it increases, the shape begins to be more and more normally distributed. So we will end up using some of these definitions. I just want to quickly review with you. So we started by saying we have an entire population and we from that population have parameters that we're interested in mu and p so the population mean population proportion when we take samples using different sampling methods or a simple random sample we would expect to find a different value of x bar and p hat each time because the sample itself is random okay so if we were to do that over and over and over again until we got all possible values of p hat or this applies to x bar too we would end up with a population of values of p hat which is actually referred to as the sampling distribution of a statistic, which our statistic here is p-hat. So that would be like having this population. Well, for a sampling distribution, to describe it, you need to talk about the center, variability, and shape. So we use the example from the textbook that looked at the state of Florida and taking different random samples of size 100, 250, and 500. We know that the parameter is 0 0.028. So each of these distributions is of p-hat values. This one made up of samples of size 100, the one after of 250, and then 500. So these are p-hat values that are being graphed. The center here is 0 0.03. It ranges from 0 to 0.1, and the shape is right skewed. When we move into the 250, some things that we notice is that this is still a distribution of p-hat values. It has the same center, though, which happens to be the same as the population proportion, or p. It has a lower variability as the sample size increased, and now the shape is beginning to look more slightly right skewed than it was in the graph before. Finally, we get to samples of size 500. We notice it still has the same center, which is the population proportion. We notice that the variability has decreased again. So instead of going from 0 to 0.7 or 0 0.07, it's from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05. And we also notice that it ends up being bell-shaped. Now, these are the three facts that we've visually noticed. The center of the sampling distribution of p hat is p. And we can say the same for the center of the sampling distribution of x bar is mu. So if we did the same situation with x bar values, we would find that. We also know that the variability will decrease as sample size increases. And then finally, as the sample size increases, the shape begins to look more and more normally distributed. So when we get into statistical inference, these facts are going to be valuable for us because we'll be using x bar to estimate mu and p hat to estimate p. And knowing these facts and what we do about the sampling distribution will help us use those values, those statistics well, to estimate those parameters. See you in future videos.